biggest homeless shelter will soon be on the move. But that move means more beds and more services, but it does not come without controversy. I find that the low income housing for minorities, um, they're being pushed out to the suburbs. And then, you know, people, middle class and all that are bringing, being brought into the inner city where all the resources are. So their idea of this change is not beneficial. The drop in center is Cincinnati's largest men's homeless shelter. The shelter was recently moved from the southwest corner of Washington Park in Cincinnati's over the Rhine neighborhood at 12th and Elm Streets into an area known as Queensgate in the old butternut bread factory. The physical removal of the site of help for those experiencing homelessness is intentional, according to Miami University professor Thomas Dutton. The drop in center now exists across the interstate, a barrier Dutton refers to as impassable, like the Mississippi River, recalling the displacement of Native American peoples. However, if we examine the history of this area, we find that the marginalized people who have lived in what is now Queensgate were displaced merely 50 years ago by the construction of Interstate 75 and a program of urban renewal. Econocide is the intentional devaluing of certain groups, the economic exclusion of a particular demographic, and their ultimate removal from the plan of progress. Further, the research reviewed for this documentary point to econocide as the driving socio-political arrangement in cities in the United States since urban renewal. Dutton understands that the removal of the drop-in center is part of a process of cleaning up over the Rhine, in other words, gentrification. Using Dutton and his sources, I'll argue that the justifications for urban renewal are the same for present-day gentrification and its resulting econocide. The forces of econocide are more powerfully enforced and legitimated by a culture of historical amnesia regarding urban renewal and the racial and economic histories and motivations of urban renewal. Urban renewal and gentrification are not so different. Econocide has been the dominant socio-economic arrangement in American cities since the advent of urban renewal and continues today. Showing viewers the historic parallels between urban renewal and present-day gentrification are important to tell because they may influence the way citizens vote, talk, and think about present-day gentrification. Cincinnati was settled in the late 1700s because of its desirable location on the Ohio River. Settlement of the area was originally limited to the basin area, shown here. The functional area of Cincinnati's commercial, industrial, and residential success was limited to the basin because of the surrounding steep hills. Eventually, cogwheel trains, cable cars, or later automobiles overcame these geographic obstacles. In the west end of the basin, a dense working class neighborhood formed. Initially, according to Davis and Taylor, the area was of mixed income. Workers lived near their bosses. The wealthy industrialist labor bosses lived in an area of Dayton Street called Millionaire's Row. These industrialists were part of the rendering and pork industries. Because it was convenient and inexpensive to live near the place of employment, this area was eventually intensified and achieved a great density. The area we will be studying, Kenyon Bar, is outlined and shaded here. In this selection of images made from U.S. Census data, you can see the intensification and concentration of Cincinnati's African-American population in the West End. Through the years, however, in several urban renewal schemes, the residents were moved out. But through this series, we can see that after urban renewal began displacing people in the 1960s through the 70s, the population was either reconcentrated into available public housing projects or into neighboring over the Rhine or Avondale. More than 20,000 people lived in the West End at its high point. By the 1990s, however, Cincinnati's black population had been dispersed throughout the entirety of Cincinnati. Through the 20th century, in cities all across America, a new version of industrial capitalism was transforming the urban landscape. Unskilled workers from the American South and immigrants from European countries began selling their labor for a wage. Stratification and standardization premiered on the manufacturing scene as jobs were de-skilled in a matter of months. What used to take days to produce now took hours or minutes. Nearly everything that Americans used was produced in a factory by 1950. Through this mass production revolution, housing was also standardized. Former inner city workers throughout Cincinnati populated many suburbs. The more well-off white citizens moved out to get away from a creeping feeling that the inner city was not a good place to live. We know this as white flight. Racial biases, mythologies, and discrimination define entirely the history of housing policy in the mid-20th century. As many African Americans migrated out of the southern United States in the early 1900s, 
they sought employment and housing in northern cities, cities that were expanding in the interwar years and the postwar years. After 1910, many African Americans who switched to an updated form of slave labor known as sharecropping were able to move to northern cities to help with the war effort during the First World War. Although African Americans were never able to work in union shops before, the demand for labor was so high during wartime that manufacturers permitted migrant African Americans to work producing armaments, planes, tanks, and so on. Over 30,000 African Americans lived heavily concentrated in the West End by the 1930s. However, through the Depression, racist attitudes in Cincinnati increased. The Ku Klux Klan reports a membership of 15,000 by 1929, at a time when the population of Cincinnati was 400,000. That's 4% of the population. However, through the Second World War, more African Americans entered the labor force in Cincinnati. This intensified one of the only neighborhoods where African Americans could even get housing. In order to alleviate the need for housing after the end of the Second World War, the Housing Act of 1949 was passed, with Cincinnati politician Robert A. Taft, son of Howard Taft, at the helm. The Housing Act paved the way for slums to be cleared and public housing to be built. By the time urban renewal projects were complete in the 1970s, several housing projects would be complete in the West End, Laurel Homes, Stanley Row Towers, and Parktown Cooperative Homes, to name a few. The real plan, however, was not to build housing, it was to rezone this area known as Kenyon Bar as an industrial district, put an interstate through it, and use federal monies to seize property and build a highway a year before the Federal Highway Act was passed under Eisenhower in 1956. <laughs> We just watched a clip from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a film about a group of cartoon characters who live in their own part of Hollywood. Judge Doom, the man you just heard speaking, is a land developer in the film. His mission to build an interstate through Toontown by demolishing it is reflective of the larger reasons put forth to justify urban renewal. Here, the ridiculous talking mice could be stand-ins for African Americans, Toontown could be the slum area, Kenyon Bar in the West End, and Judge Doom represents the political bodies and planning commissions that made it happen. This is where blight comes in, a descriptive term applied to aging neighborhoods and buildings in inner cities across America. Planning schools in the United States taught that these inner city areas with their mixed-use neighborhoods and narrow streets were de facto slums, as written about in Jane Jacobs' The Death and Life of Great American Cities. The creation of these neighborhoods as slums in the popular imagination was a product of the consciousness of modernism in planning schools. Planning schools were convinced that the future city would have high-speed interstates, tall, steel and glass towers to house many, many residents, set in park-like surroundings, of course. This rhetoric of blight, that said that these areas were hideous and needed to be destroyed, was important and powerful in the course of urban renewal. Even this clip that we're about to watch is important in the consensus building process that brought nearly 2,000 buildings down in the West End. I highlighted the incidents in the use of the word poverty because I thought it could have had a lot of influence on viewers from their homes in the suburbs. Poverty, 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 lack of money. Cincinnati, poverty, poverty, soiled by poverty, solid mass of misery. Lower West Side, poverty, hopeless, poverty-stricken, poverty, squalid beginnings, poverty, a lower West Side, poverty, substandard. That's an official term. Poverty, poverty-stricken, poverty is poverty, poverty-stricken, and poverty, poverty, products of poverty, 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 poor, poverty, poverty, poverty-stricken, poverty, and it goes on and on and on. Because of the creation of these places as slums, they were devalued, made obsolete, though they were thriving communities. Take it from John Harshaw, a man who grew up in Kenyon Bar on 7th Street. Uh, there were over 3,000 people living in that, in that community. There were more than 3,000 businesses in that community until the, the bulldozers came and tore down not only the buildings, but tore down a lot of people's connection to each other because what happened was community was torn down. Here we can see the process unfold in photographs taken by the U.S. Geological Survey from 1949 to 1970. 
You can see the footprint of Interstate 75 laid out initially, beginning in 1955 with the strategic purchasing of buildings. It cost 30 million in federal dollars, and voters approved a bond issue worth 9 million. By the end of the project in 1966, the city almost broke even because of the purchase of land by incoming manufacturers. By 1970, the process was complete. The land that formerly housed around 30,000 people, primarily African Americans, was sold to manufacturing firms like Ford, Hootapol, the Postal Service, and Holiday Inn, among many others. The City and Planning Commission, along with the power of media through news organizations, editorial cartoons, and letters, were able to generate the consensus that this place was of no value and needed to go. Even though the residents of Kenyon Bar lived the best lives they could, the mechanisms of power and racism succeeded in devaluing the neighborhood and building what they saw as the ideal city, a place of industry, production, and productivity. When urban renewal or urban removal came, it was the end. They dusted off the old Queensgate plan that had sat on the tables and in the closets here in Cincinnati for a very long time and decided it was time for us to go. Of those structures, only four of 2,800 residents were, uh, of those houses were without building code violations, but that was home. We never knew that we were poor. When the vote came for urban renewal to tear down the West End, all the whites voted no. Some voted because they thought if they tore it down, that population had to go somewhere, and they were concerned it might be their neighborhoods, so they voted no. The blacks voted yes. And they voted yes because they were told, we're going to tear this down and we're going to build you something special. And you can come back after we build you something special. And that never happened. The same kind of thing is happening today in Over the Rhine. Longtime residents are apparently not generating enough tax revenue for the city, quasi-public entity, the Cincinnati Center City Development Corporation, or 3CDC, is working to gentrify over the Rhine and bring in wealthier residents to bolster the city's coffers and give Cincinnati a renewed image as a place for young, successful people. The byproduct of these messages of progress have created a class of residents who have lived in over the Rhine that are now determined to be lazy, homeless, or dependent on the government, parasites, single mothers, and so on. This frames them as a nuisance that needs to be removed. This is just one facet of a conicide. These people will be displaced again. Further than being recast as dependents of the state, researchers like Henry Giroux point out the market logics of gentrification pit people against one another in a primal form of social combat to compete for space and dominance in the city. He refers to this as the politics of disposability. There's a new reality, you write, emerging in America, in no small part because of the media, one that enshrines a politics of disposability. The notion that economics is divorced from ethics. The notion that the only obligation of citizenship is consumerism. The notion that the welfare state is a pathology. That the, any form of dependency basically is disreputable and needs to be attacked. I mean, this is, this is a vicious set of assumptions.